Thank you. Thank you. So last year in Time Magazine, they ran an article um, with the title, How to Cure Cancer. Um, and if within that article they really had the answer, we would, we would not all be still uh, combating this really formidable disease. Um, but they had a really interesting description of what cancer is. They said it's an intricate and potentially lethal collaborations of genes gone awry, of growth hormones, uh, inhibitors gone missing, of hormones and epigenomes changing, and rogue cells breaking free. It works as a great armed force, attacking by the equivalent of air, land, and sea, and stealth. And what are we going to do about it, is the question. Um, and one of the provocative little taglines they had in that article was, the hero scientist that defeats cancer will likely never exist. So the real point uh, behind this was saying, we won't have that one um, renowned scientist who one day says, I have found the cure. We, we won't even be able to point to one person's lab or one person's group in order to, um, to uh, combat cancer. Instead, team-based approaches using cross-disciplinary tools are really what's upending the tradition and delivering results faster. And more often than not, uh, mathematical modeling and computational modeling are becoming part of the tools and, and mathematicians are becoming part of the team of scientists that are helping to deliver these results. So that's what I do. So why is cancer so difficult to treat? As you know, it's not just one disease. Cancer is the name given to over 200 diseases, right? And um, the cancer cells have developed special properties that make them very different than your normal cells. So some of the things that cancer cells can do are um, they can sustain proliferation or division without signals from the surrounding body. They can evade the signals of the surrounding body that tell them to stop dividing. They can invade and move into tissue. They um, are, some, some cancer cells are actually immortal, so they keep dividing um, um, more than uh, normal cells do. They resist cell death. And the thing we're gonna talk about tonight is the potential uh, for inducing angiogenesis. So cancer cells develop the ab ability to create new blood vessels, okay? So those are some of the reasons cancer cells are so different than normal cells. The bottom picture shows how once a cell acquires all or some of these mutations, it begins to grow. Um, the growth of those cells um, begins to overtake a tissue. There's some shape changes that come along with it. Uh, before a cancer has broken through the, the boundaries of the surrounding tissues, it's called in situ. And then blood vessels from the surrounding uh, tissue begin to grow and the cancer cells can actually become invasive. So we, from quantitative backgrounds, like to think of cancer as a complex dynamical system. What that means is we recognize its actions that cut across all levels of biology, right? From those mutations that are acquired at the genetic level to the production of um, irregular uh, production of proteins, to abnormal signaling that goes on within the cells, on up to what we see as observables, which are organ level um, uh, growth, of, uh, growth of cancer cells in, in a particular organ, and it can spread to other organ systems. So we are looking at a full scale uh, spectrum of things that cancer cells can do, and those operate on a variety of spatial scales and temporal scales. So mathematicians have been throwing everything, every tool in our toolbox at these various processes of cancer. So these are all different mathematical techniques that people have used to try to answer questions at all of those different levels of biology. And you'll see that the lines are a little bit blurred, and that's on purpose, because now today, what we're really interested in is using a variety of mathematical techniques to help us answer questions about the coordination of all of these things. Instead of just focusing on one thing, can we say something about how these things are coordinated? So my research typically looks at three different scales. I look at intracellular signaling networks, so what's going on, what's uh, happening inside cells, 
how that leads to single cells making certain decisions, and how that leads to a whole population of cells, population level observables like a growing tumor. So you could pick a variety of different things that you, wanted to, that you want to study in terms of uh, cancer progression. You could look at how do tumors, how are they initiated in the first place. You could look at how they invade into surrounding tissues. You could look at how they enter the bloodstream and move from one organ to, a, to another. Or you could look at how tumors acquire this ability to um, generate their own vascular supply. That's angiogenesis, and that's what I'm going to focus on for this talk tumor-induced blood vessel formation. And mathematicians have been interested in this for a long time. Probably the early 80s was the very first mathematical model that came out. Um, but since then, our knowledge of the underlying biology has changed and grown. And so we've been able to develop better and better mathematical models um, now today. So let's just give some definitions so we all understand the, the full um, nature of the problem. Angiogenesis, as we said, is the formation of blood vessels from the existing vascular supply. Happens all the time in physiological processes. Probably the most common uh, is wound healing. So if you have a dermal or internal wound, you might need to create new blood vessels in order to heal it. It also happens in some pathological situations. It can be prolonged in those situations. So sometimes in arthritis and some types of ulcers, you might get some hypervascularization or some extra blood vessels that you may not need. But only in tumor growth is angiogenesis or blood vessel formation sustained. As that tumor grows, every new addition of tissue mass is supplemented by an addition of vasculature, of an addition of new blood vessels. So we have sustained angiogenesis or blood vessel growth in the case of cancer. And um, one way to think about how this happens is the angiogenic switch. So there's natural inhibitors of blood vessel formation and there's natural activators of the processes. In normal situations, the switch is off because you don't need new blood vessels forming very often. Um, when you need to heal a wound or sometimes in pathological situations, the switch is turned on and then it's turned off later. But in angiogenesis, when it comes to tumors, that switch is turned on and it remains on. So the tumors find a way to keep secreting activators so that the balance between the activators and inhibitors is switched and we get sustained blood vessel formation, which allows the tumor to continue to grow and invade. All right, so there are, there are several things that go on with uh, blood vessel formation. We're going to talk about things at two different levels. There's the molecular uh, level or the biochemistry of what's going on, and then there's also some tissue level biomechanics. So let's talk about the, the molecular biology really quickly first. So here you see a tumor growing in the distance. This tumor begins to secrete activators that are going to flip that switch and turn on angiogenesis, right? So this activator is called VEGF, and I'm going to come back to that one uh, a number of times in the talk. These activators diffuse out into space, find a nearby blood vessel. They bind to receptors on the cell surfaces. These cells are called endothelial cells. They line the surfaces of blood vessels. And when this binding takes place, so this is a, a blow up of what might be going on in the cell. All kinds of things begin to light up, all kinds of signaling pathways are activated, and that leads the cell to move, migration. It leads to vascular permeability, so gaps form in the blood vessel. It makes these cells live longer in harsher environments, and it makes these cells divide. So this one angiogenic activator or stimulator can result in all of these things happening inside these, for these endothelial cells all of those things which are necessary to form new blood vessels. Now at the tissue level, so now we're going to go up a scale, we see that cells are actually dividing, so some are dividing. Some are, are sending out these protrusions so that they can crawl and move. They're crawling and moving on the tissue fibers called extracellular matrix, so they're crawling and moving and in space. So there's all kinds of tissue level biomechanics associated with these events. So what we want to do is be able to develop mathematical models that may be able to address some of these um, 
things that these endothelial cells are doing in response to cancer that leads to this increased vessel production. Why are we interested in that, you may ask? Well, what we want to do is stop it, right? We want to stop this from happening. So if we've got this tumor growing, and then it secretes these uh, stimulators that will shift the, the balance, these activators of angiogenesis, it becomes a vascular tumor. It's got its own blood vessel supply now. Our goal, of course, is to block that in some way if we can. Is there any way that we can stop this from happening? If we were able to stop blood vessel formation, we should be able to shrink that tumor back down to a very small, um, harmless, almost non-detectable size, right? So that's the idea behind anti-angiogenic treatments, looking at ways to attack the blood vessels. Kind of different than what traditional chemotherapy is, right? So traditional chemotherapy, you're attacking the cancer cells. Now we're not attacking cancer cells. We're attacking the blood vessel cells that feed them. All right, so has this worked? Well, in 1998, um, the very first uh, drug that attacked the blood vessels, was, um, was uh, created and um, there was a full two-page ad in the New York Times about this drug because they treated mice with human tumors and they shrunk those tumors in all the mice that they gave this drug to and it looked really, really promising. And even um, James Watson, the James Watson, um, was quoted as saying that the person, Judah Folkman, who um, developed this drug would cure cancer in two years. So it is well beyond two years later, and we know that hasn't quite happened, right? And it didn't take long to realize that we weren't going to see that kind of, you know, phenomenal result from, from that particular drug. So as, as early as 2002, they reprinted, uh, a competitor to New York Times, printed a, a story showing that even though it works so well in mice, having it approved to, to treat tumors in man did not lead to those um, same type of results. Although it's safe, the idea is still a good one, still promising, but this particular drug was not going to be that cure-all that we had hoped for. So what's going on today? Well, since that drug didn't work out, there are several other things, other targets for angiogenesis that we're looking at, because the idea is a good one, right? It makes sense. Let's see if we can't come up with some other ways of blocking um, the process of angiogenesis. So the first drug operated here. It was an antibody that attacked the stimulators. So it bound to the stimulators, and if the stimulators are um, uh, otherwise occupied, they can't initiate blood vessel formation. Now there are drugs that um, stop the production of these stimulators, so stop, try to stop the tumor from shifting that balance in the first place. There are drugs that do things to the receptors on the endothelial cells. And the two types of drugs we're most interested in are new drugs that inhibit the survival mechanisms that these endothelial cells have. So when you think about your blood vessel cells, right, they're nice and protected inside a blood vessel with lumen and um, other cells surrounding them. When they get out into the harsh environment of the normal tissue where they have to travel to make new blood vessels, they're susceptible to death. So they upregulate all kinds of survival proteins in order to stay alive. So we want to think about blocking things at that level, the survival of these cells. We can also think about inhibiting the maturation of these vessels. So a lot of things have to happen for these vessels to stabilize and to be able to support blood flow. What if we can block things at that level? So all kinds of new drugs are out there, and those are the two types that we're most interested in. So what do we do as a mathematician, as a mathematical modeler? who is trying to develop a model that may say something beneficial to the cancer community. We take everything that we know biologically, so there's a whole bunch of biology known, the intracellular level, the cellular level, the tissue level. We take all the biology that we know, we put it in this construct that we call a mathematical model, right? And we begin to, um, find solutions of that model, try to figure out what that model is saying, and we then interpret those solutions in a way that could be helpful to the biologist. 
And it turns out to be um, an iterative process, right? So we, we put all the biology into a model, and then we give back from the model some biological insight, and then we see whether that, in, we validate by seeing if that insight was correct, and then we can, can repeat the, the process. So looking at angiogenesis, there are two things you could potentially want to study. There is the, the um, sort of translational problem, translational meaning something that can go from um, the lab or, or the computer uh, actually to a patient, looking at therapeutics, right? So we could look at modeling therapies that actually stop blood vessel formation. Or you might just be interested in the basic science of how are these cells doing this? How are they able to integrate all of these biochemical cues and all, at the molecular level with all of the biomechanical cues that they're getting for how to move and crawl and the actual process of doing that? How do they, how do they, how do, they do this in order to form blood vessels in the first place? So those are two critical, yet separate but connected, uh, avenues of research. So we're going to talk a little bit about how we might develop models for both of those kinds of questions. All right, so if we look at the basic science question first, looking at that line of research, what are some questions we could ask that a mathematical model may be able to help us answer? So some things we don't really understand about the basic science of blood vessel formation is, um, for one, what factors influence the distribution of um, cells with different properties, different characteristics in a developing sprout. So cells might be dividing, like you saw in that cartoon picture, or they might be the cell at the front that's protruding these big um, projections to crawl, or they could just be resting and, and just contributing to the development of the sprout. So what, um, what are the, the things that influence whether a cell decides to do one of those things and not the other? And then uh, another question we could ask is how do these cells change their orientation or polarize in response to these activators? So the, the tumor is secreting these activators for one purpose, to get these cells to come towards the tumor, grow blood vessels towards the tumor. How do these cells change what they're normally doing, polarize, redirect, and make their way directly to the tumor? And um, sort of the bigger question is knowing that they're doing this via chemical and mechanical cues, how do they integrate these things? How do they determine um, which cues to listen to when and how is it all coordinated to decide when, where, and how to actually move? So the first models that we're going to look at try to answer these questions mostly from the biochemistry um, point of view, the molecular dynamics. So let's talk about what these models might want to do. So the first thing I want to tell you about is a hybrid system. So a hybrid system is a system that both moves smoothly or continuously and has components that might move discreetly or jump. So one way to think about this is a bouncing ball. If I were to bounce a ball and it bounced, hit the ground, and bounced again, bounced again, it would be moving smoothly or continuously in between bounces, but as soon as it hit the ground, there'd be a discrete change in the velocity of that ball. Right? So there's both continuous and discrete um, components to, to that particular type of motion. And the same thing is true with angiogenesis. So we've got these chemical stimulators that move smoothly or continuously through the tissue, but then we've got these cells that make their own decisions, and they decide when, where, and how to move some other way um, other than a continuous um, in, influx of, of information. So we want to use that type of approach to try to capture what's going on with these cells. So what this picture shows is that specialized cell that's at the front of a developing sprout. It's called a tip cell. You see this is a, um, an image of one that's sending out those projections and using it to move and crawl. And then the cells behind it sort of follow along its path. So let's see if we can't um, come up with a way of describing the motion of a cell like this, a tip cell that's already programmed to, to want to move. How does it move? So our goal is to capture this directed motion. It's due to binding of these stimulators of angiogenesis, right? 
and uptaking those uh, uh, regulators. And we want to measure the subsequent activation of those cells and to quantify how the cell moves in response to these stimulators. So that's the goal. So we've got this molecular level bit, and we're going to try to capture it first and then add on to it some of the, the tissue level biomechanics. So here's a schematic diagram of what we're looking at for the model. So we're going to sit a parent vessel on one end of the domain, our tumor on the other end of the domain. Our tumor is going to secrete all of these angiogenic stimulators that flip the switch, right? And then we're going to have a migrating tip cell somewhere in that domain. That tip cell has um, receptors on its surface that are going to interact with and bind to the, to the uh, angiogenic stimulators. And based on how much of the stimulator is bound to the receptors on the cell surface, the cell is going to polarize and stretch to move in that direction. So in this situation, um, because the stimulators are coming from the tumor source, there's more here than there, than there would be here, for example. And so the cell is going to have more bound to this cell face than it does to this cell face. And therefore, it's going to try to move from left to right. So once the binding happens and it, decide, and it polarizes in the direction of bound stimulator, it moves from one lattice point to the next. Okay? So that's the idea behind the model. So just a little bit about the mathematics that went into this. So we're deriving a, a basically a souped up random walk. So what is a random walk? So say I'm standing here and I can move up, back, left, or right and there's a probability associated with me moving in any of those directions. And I can write down what that probability is, right? So I would choose a starting point, and I give a probability, I've got them being equal here, probability of moving up, down, left, and right, and let, my, let the simulation run, or let, let the, the walker walk, so to speak. So everybody, this is just an example of what happens here. We start at this point here, zero, zero, and the black, the blue, the green, and the red are four different walkers following this random uh, movement pattern where they, where they either go up, down, left, or right. And you see each walker ends up after 100 steps at very different spots, the blue one, the black one, the green one, the red one. So that's basically the kind of thing we're going to use to describe how this, um, this particular tip cell is moving. But we have to add a few things, right? It's not just an equal probability that this cell goes forward, backwards, left, and right. So this tip cell is a biased random walker. It walks depending on where this chemical stimulator is. So we can write down still, these are just souped up ways of writing down probabilities of moving left, or sorry, uh, right, left, up, and down, or waiting at the same spot. Right, so it's the same idea of the, the simpler version we just saw. After the magic of mathematics, you can turn that into um, a partial differential equation or an equation for uh, motion of this particle. So you don't have to worry about what this equation says, but I do want you to think about some of the components of this equation. So the first component is random motion, random, random motion or diffusion. So it's the passive movement of these cells, if you want to think about it in a cellular way, of um, cells along their own concentration gradient. And then the other component that we end up with using this simple um, random walk idea is chemotaxis. So this is the movement of cells along a chemical gradient, which makes sense that we get a term like this because we know these cells are moving in response to this particular angiogenic stimulator. So there's a velocity that these cells are moving with, a speed, if you will, that they're moving with, and then there's also a direction that they're moving in, all governed by how much of this stimulator is present. So I just want to, because this chemotaxis is such a, an important idea to capture, I just want to show you what it looks like when cells do this. Unless we freeze again. Okay, maybe no more. 
movie. Okay. Okay. So you see that there was a line of a chemical source that was here, and the cells were moving towards that source. Okay, sorry about that. I'm gonna have to give up on that one. So the idea is wherever the chemical is, the cells move in a directed fashion towards that source. And they do that by sending out these projections and, and actually polarizing, changing their orientation to approach that chemical that they really like. So putting all that together, what we can do is capture how long it takes, so this is the time taken, for the cells to move across a domain of a given size, trying to reach that stimulus, for different amounts of the stimulator. So what we see is that for very small amounts, it takes a long time, and for very large amounts, it takes a long time. But only for very intermediate, um, for, uh, for the stimulator in very intermediate concentrations do we get the fastest migration time. So these cells, these special tip cells that are trying to guide a vessel, um, need just the right amount of this stimulator in order to do that in the most efficient manner. So this is one of the kinds of results that the mathematical model can tell you. So these are just pictures of the, um, of the path that this tip cell would take for different amounts of our stimulator. So this is a small amount of stimulator, and you see that the path that it takes is rather random. Uh, it finally gets a drift of, the, of the, the amount of stimulator and starts moving in a directed fashion, but late. Here, we have just the right amount, so we move directly across the domain. There's not a lot of meandering, if you will. The cell picks up the, the scent of the, of the stimulator and follows it directly. But then, if there is too much of the stimulator, again, the cells kind of become desensitized to it, and they move and meander around. Eventually, they make it across but it takes a lot longer and there's a lot more movement in other directions besides the direction of the source. So these are just the probabilities of moving up, down, left, and right, and you see for the, the amount of stimulator that was just in the sweet spot, if you will, the probability of moving to the right was the greatest for the longest amount of time. So you're able to get there, um, get to the other side, to the, to the source, the fastest. All right, so now we want that tip cell to be a leader. It's gonna be the leader and it's going to uh, drag behind it several uh, blood vessel cells that are gonna create the capillary. So now we're gonna make that, stem, that tip cell a leader cell and watch what happens when we track full vessels growing under those same three circumstances. So here's the optimal concentration of our stimulator. We see the tip cells lead to a structure of blood vessels that move almost directly across the domain. If you have a, a suboptimal amount of that stimulator, you get very stunted growth of vessels. We just could not get enough activation to, um, to polarize the cells and have them divide. But then if you get too much of that stimulator, you get cells that are just me meandering around so much and becoming um, dividing too much, and actually it slows down the growth. So, the, so this is all taken at the same time, looking at the spatial, um, looking at how far these vessels got in space, and you see this one got a lot, uh, about 20% less the distance than, um, than this one. So you're moving slower and you're creating a really excessively um, vascular uh, situation. So there really are optimal concentrations of this particular stimulator that lead to the most um, efficient uh, blood vessel uh, production. So some good things and some bad things about this. So the good things are that you are able to include some of the molecular level details, some of the biochemistry of how blood vessels form. You're able to capture exactly what we wanted to, how cells change their shape and orient themselves in uh, the direction of a gradient, oh, in the direction of a chemical stimulator. 
Um, the bad news is that this was just the biochemistry. We really didn't have any of those tissue level uh, biomechanical features in that particular model. So we want to see if we can't add some of that. Looking at some of the tissue and cell uh, interactions, cell interactions with the tissue and how they actually move and crawl. All right, so um, there really is a need for this new kind of approach. So we want to make sure that um, we're not just looking at that leader cell. So the last model, we looked at what the leader did and all the other cells just kind of followed along. But we know that all of those cells in the sprout really are contributing in some way to the formation of these new vessels, right? And we also want to be able to predict things about the shape, speed, and um, morphology of these vessels, right? instead of prescribing them. So this time we're gonna use a slightly different approach. What we're gonna do is take our same domain and we're gonna partition it into different kinds of cells. The red E cells are the blood vessel cells, endothelial cells. We have M, which are the tissue fibers, the matrix fibers. We have F, which is the fluid that's present in tissue, interstitial fluid and T, which are the uh, stromal cells, the natural cells that may just exist inside your tissue. We're gonna let the cells have a finite volume, but deform and change their shape in response to biochemical and biomechanical cues. And then we're gonna let the cells interact with each other through their boundaries. So cells can interact with the fluid, they can interact with each other, they can interact with the tissue cells or the matrix, all through their boundary. And then we're going to let the system run until we have a minimum ener of energy. So we're trying to minimize the total energy in the system. And the way we do this is we take a, a particular lattice site, we change it, so we, we see if this endothelial cell wants to move uh, into this extracellular matrix fiber, we change it to one of its unlike neighbors. And if the energy of that change is smaller, then we accept it. If the energy of that change is larger, then we, we still might accept it, but with some probability. That's how, we get to, that's how we let the system run to minimum energy. So here's our domain. Again, the parent vessel's on one side. The tumor cells are on the other side. We've got this domain with extracellular matrix fibers and tissue cells. And then we've got our, our blood vessel cells um, ready to move along into this. Uh, let's try this movie again. Move along into our tissue space. Ah, this one's working. Okay, so what you see here are actual, oh, I see, I see, where's that box? There we go. So what you see there are the cells moving and actually crawling along those extracellular matrix fibers. They're following the path laid out by the stimulators to reach the other side of the domain. And what you saw there in the middle was when two vessels came close to each other, they actually formed a closed loop, which has to naturally happen to support blood flow. And those are things that were emergent properties of the model. It's nothing that we put into the model or expected to happen, it's the natural um, minimum energy state of the system. So we were happy to see that we can get these realistic vessel structures, um, realistic um, formations of loops, realistic branching, all of those kinds of things when we added in the, the tissue level biomechanics of the process. So we could also do a few other things with this. We could see how um, experimentally sometimes they see these really small, skinny, tortuous vessels other times they see these really plump fat vessels, and we could test out what um, in the model could give us those skinnier vessels versus fat vessels, and it really dependent, uh, depended on uh, the profile of the stimulator. So a very steep profile of the stimulator gave uh, thin, skinny, tortuous vessels, and a really shallow profile of the stimulator gave these big, fat, plump vessels, and that seems to be um, consistent with what they saw experimentally. So some good and some bad things about this approach. We were able to keep our gains that we made with the biochemistry and add on to it some of the tissue mechanics into the model. Um, and we could get realistic sprout structures and we could get realistic sprout extension speeds. All of that was very good. But we are tracking every single cell and every single sprout and its shape changes 
and it's really computationally expensive. It takes a lot of computing power to do that, um, which means it's going to be really hard to do what we want to do. And what we want to do is say something about treatment, right? So that was our original goal. So we needed to come up with a way to keep everything we've gained without some of the things that we may not need. What, what could we do away with? We don't need to know the shape of every single cell in the vessel. We just need to know its contributions, right? If we knew that, that would be enough for us to say something about developing therapies. So we want to develop realistic models that can say something about therapy. So that's the next thing. All right, so these, our, our next approach was to get rid of all of that structure that we had, but keep everything else. What are the essentials? We need a tip cell, and we need all of the cells in the stalk, and we need to make sure we have all of their contributions. They can grow, they can divide, um, they can be um, recruited from the parent vessel, um, and um, we know we need to keep track of their mass so we know when they divide, and they can also either be resting or proliferating, so we need to know how mature they are, how um, likely they are to be proliferating. So we keep track of all of those things. And then for the tip cell, um, we recognize it has two parts, and that's the only two parts we need to know about the tip cell. We need to know about the projections that it, they extend out, and then we know, need to know about the main body. And given those two parts of the cell, we can say, let's model this as a tethered spring, something that can spring itself out and is adhered to the cells behind it. So that's a very um, a reasonable way of developing a mathematical approach to just the tip cell. Putting all of that together, we can get these, these structures, realistic vas vascular structures. So this is a mathematical model simulation on the top compared to experimental images of corneal angiogenesis. So this is, they place a tumor in the middle of a cornea, watch the blood vessels around the cornea grow into the tumor. So this is day four, this is day seven. And we were able to validate that our extension speeds matched exactly what they saw experimentally. These pictures are just to remind you that we haven't lost everything we gained with the, with the biochemistry. We're still tracking all of the, um, cell, the uh, chemical uh, stimulators along the sprouts um, and keeping track of those as the, as the vasculature develops. We're all, we also haven't lost all of that information we had about the tissue structure. So if we have a very uniform tissue structure, we get very uniform sprouts. And if we have a very non-uniform underlying tissue structure, we see we still get that tortuosity that we saw, these curvy looking sprouts, and the speeds of extension are slower. So we're keeping all of the things we've gained, but being able to do this a lot faster and more efficiently computationally. And the reason we wanted to do this, of course, is so that we could say something about therapy. Okay, so here's our first therapeutic um, uh, simulation. So what we have here is our, our, our um, blood vessels growing without any therapy, and we were matching it to experimental data. So the experimental data are the circles, uh, triangles, and squares, and the solid lines are our model. So without therapy, we're getting exactly the right extension speeds. Now if we give it um, a, an amount of irradiation, which stops the cells from growing, we see our model is still capturing how far these vessels extend into space. And then if we give it a little bit more, um, we see the model is still capturing that. So we're getting very good agreement with experimental data on, on um, blocking the cells from moving. And the yellow and the blue are just curves showing if we remove certain features of our model, how well can we match the data? And it turns out you, we can't match the data very well at all if we move the amount of branching or remove the amount of um, how mature the cells are. So those two things were essential features in order to get um, corroboration with the experimental, experimental data. So these are just pictures of the same uh, amounts of treatment, what the vessel structures actually looked like as you um, gave it this amount of irradiation. So we can also look at some of the therapies uh, that they're actually using to block blood vessels. So this is looking at how far the sprouts extend into space over um, a 14-day period, starting therapy on day seven. Um, looking at just therapy that blocks these inhibitors, just like that very first drug that was invented. So the yellow one is no treatment, and you reach the full, um, you go all the way across the domain in nine days. And then if you start giving 
this drug, you see that the, the, how far you get into the domain decreases as the amount of drug increases. So you're actually stopping the, the blood vessels from growing, which is exactly what you would expect. And then you can give combination treatment. So you can give treatment that blocks the stimulator and treatment that blocks um, maturation, and you get even uh, more pronounced reduction in how far these vessels are able to travel over that same period of time. So this is increasing the amount of combination treatment, and you're really suppressing how far these vessels will go. Um, so we're also looking at, as I mentioned, our other big interest is survival, looking at therapies that block survival. So uh, we're developing models that have the tumor cells, the secretion of the stimulator, um, the, the binding to the surfaces, the formation of vessels that, again, feed the tumor. But now we're putting inside these cells a survival cascade, so a, a cell signaling pathway for survival so that we can see what targets within the signaling pathway we can block in order to get the best reduction in therapy, or best reduction in blood vessel uh, formation. So here are some of the things that we can, we can do with that kind of model. So here we're looking at the tumor cell size, or tumor population size, if you want, tumor cell density versus time. And here we're looking at the vascular compositions, the sprout density within that same tumor over those same amount of days. For early treatment, so we're treating these cells with these survival drugs on day one, or late therapy. So we let the tumor grow to some large size and then start giving therapy. And in each case, what we found is, so for a small amount of drug, all we're doing is delaying the growth of the tumor. But if we give a drug above a threshold, we actually get reduction. Same thing with the vascular structure. We are de delaying development of, de of the vasculature for small doses, but a dose above a threshold, you're actually getting um, regression of the, of the blood vessels within the tumor. And for late stage therapy, we see that same kind of effect, right? So for small doses, we get a, a temporary reduction, temporary reduction, and then finally regression of the tumor. Temporary reduction, temporary reduction, finally, regression of the vasculature. So this threshold effect is one of the things that the mathematical model predicted before they actually knew this would happen experimentally. They'd been working with a lot of these kinds of drugs, and they hadn't seen um, the threshold effect like this. So we predicted this threshold for this particular uh, drug. They went and tested it, and actually they found, it, yes, there is this threshold effect for the survival drug um, for attacking blood vessels. So then what else can a model do? Um, the model can also help um, understand how to design a better drug. So their question was, what should we put our time and energy into to make this work even better than it does? Should I build a drug that is better at blocking the survival protein, so that's a better binder? Or should I build a drug that's just smaller, right? That gets in the cell easier, has an easier time, it's smaller, and can, and can um, permeate or internalize faster. So we did some mathematical um, simulations to figure out um, the amount of therapy required to get a cure for, for a smaller drug or a better binder. So the red dot is where they are right now with this drug. And we said, if you create a drug that's smaller, how much benefit are you going to get? And in this case, you get very little benefit. Right? If I'm already right here and I'm just making the drug um, smaller, meaning it can get inside the cell faster, I'm not getting much benefit. But if I built a drug that was a better binder, this is where they are right now with the drug, even a small change in, um, how, in the binding um, effectiveness of this drug could lead to a large change in um, the amount of therapy that is necessary for a cure. So. Better to spend your money building a better binder than a smaller, small molecule inhibitor. So that's the name of these kinds of drugs. So we, we saw that there was this issue with these drugs, right? So they worked so well in mice. They didn't work so well in man. So are they being used today? Yes, they are. So they're approved in the use for, of many cancers but they're approved um, with traditional chemotherapy. So we need to come up with mathematical models of not only these 
uh, drugs that block angiogenesis or blood vessel formation, we need to come up with models that can um, actually model combination therapy with traditional drugs as well. One of the um, most used um, traditional chemotherapeutic agent is, is a drug called cisplatin. So we've developed a mathematical model for how this traditional chemotherapeutic agent goes inside a cell, um, attaches to DNA and, and uh, sort of messes up the DNA and then ends up uh, killing the cell. Um, we look at the different phases of the cell cycle. So a, fel a cell can be in G1, it can be in G2M, or it can be arrested because of the drug and then it would lead to death. So we develop a mathematical model of, of this kind of um, traditional therapy and add it on to those um, cellular therapies. This is the kind of data we get for that. So this, they're able to tell us the viability of the cells for different concentrations of these drugs. So the uh, open squares are the traditional chemotherapy, and you see that the cells remain pretty viable for a lot of the concentrations of the traditional drug. And then um, the dark squares are the survival drug, the drug that blocks survival. And we see we definitely get some benefit from that. And then the, the triangles are the combination therapy. So we can really affect the cell viability the best with this combination therapy. So we use that data to sort of test and train the model. So these, are that, these uh, three pictures are the same data, but with the fits of the mathematical model. So we see we get pretty good fits for um, chemotherapy only, for survival therapy against blood vessels only, and for combination therapy. We also had some data on what happens with the chemotherapy inside the cell. So we use all the data that we can get to test and train and calibrate the model. And then what we want to do is give the experimentalists something like this. Tell them some way that they can optimize treatment with these kinds of drugs. So how would you optimize therapy? We know these drugs, these new drugs, are only used with chemotherapy. So they give chemotherapy no matter what. And then we can ask, should we pre-treat? with survival drugs? Should we co-treat? Or should we post-treat with survival drugs um, in order to get the best response from the tumor? So we use as our baseline giving the chemotherapy together with the survival therapy and look at how all other types of treatments would compare. So this column over here has the combination index, which is a measure of the synergy, sort of how cooperative these drugs are together. Is there any synergistic benefit to giving both of these drugs? And it turns out the only time you get really great synergy is if you post-treat with a survival drug. So we've got that here, and we've got that here are the best and most optimal ways of giving this therapy in combination. And what that means is that the traditional chemotherapy is working to sensitize these cells in some way to the survival therapy. So before you treat with a survival drug, if you give chemotherapy, the cells respond better. In fact, they, they respond worse if you pre-treat, um, and, and co-treating isn't, uh, isn't that great either. So post-treating happened to be the very best option. So this is the kind of information we want to give back to the experimentalists to help translate these drugs from what we're doing in our computer lab and what they're doing in their wet labs to a patient who could actually use this kind of information. So what's the future? What are we going to do next? Well, obviously, the reason we're developing these models of blood vessel formation in the first place is because blood vessels are what feed the tumor. Blood vessels are what um, allow the tumor to enter the bloodstream and move about your body. This is a critical transition point in cancer. So it's really important that we understand it at the, at the best, most accurate level um, that we can. So the future will be having these realistic blood vessels be the drivers of tumor growth, computational tumor growth, right? So these are a couple of proof of principle simulations showing a 2D tumor being fed by these realistic blood vessels, and here we are in 3D, um, that we can actually place this molecular therapeutics model on top of so that we can computationally watch how these tumors will shrink um, in response to drugs that attack the blood vessels, drugs that attack the tumor cells, 
and combinations of both of those. So that's where we're headed. We're not quite there yet, but we're getting there. So I just want to thank all the people who work on this stuff with me. Those are my experimental collaborators, my, my former graduate students, um, postdocs, computational collaborators, and all of the people who sort of help uh, fund this kind of research. It, um, it, I really believe that mathematicians and computational scientists uh, have a unique opportunity right now in the field of cancer research. Um, we can really help to make a difference. And um, I enjoy spending my days trying to do that. So thank you. <laughs>